Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to today's Facebook live session. On the occasion of World Liver Day, today we have with us Dr. Guru N. Reddy, founder, promoter, and director, and chief of gastroenterology and hepatology at Continental Hospitals with over four decades of experience. His areas of expertise are treatment of liver diseases and liver transplant. Today, on this occasion, Dr. Guru is here to share with us his knowledge on the effects of alcohol that majority of our today's younger generation is falling prey to and is sharing his insights on what is happening. A recent study says, sir, that the age group of first-time alcohol consumers is between 15 to 19. What can be the possible causes of this increased alcohol intake in today's younger generation? Ashwara, thank you. I think that's a very important question. And uh, we have aptly chosen the topic on the occasion of the World Liver Day. And uh, the message that we're going to give in the next several minutes uh, with regards to why the young are more susceptible in today's world in terms of taking to alcohol and drinking. You know. From my perspective, I spend you know, long periods of time in the West in the United States of America. And now I'm able to see here in the Indian continent, I think universally in this particular age group, there is some tremendous inquisitiveness, you know, to try something new. And uh, there is peer pressure, which is extremely important at the end of the day, because alcohol still is a very benign drug at the end of the day when compared to a lot of other you know, recreational drugs which young people become susceptible to and adopt in their lives. So hence this particular uh, aspect of drinking being benign, which does not have an immediate health effect on them. So I believe that there's a combination of the peer pressure, combination of certain customary things that prevail in a given community or in college campuses that you find you know, young people in this particular age group initiating or baptizing to start drinking alcohol. So, do you think that social drinking puts a pressure on uh, individuals these days? Absolutely. I think uh, you know, we all are addicts of creature at the end of the day. Young try to emulate their older folks and uh, when they see you know, their parents, you know, or their senior friends, or uncles, or aunts, and things of that nature, where they do social drinking, you know, when by the word social drinking, you're basically activating somebody who's drinking at the end of the day, a drink or two, you know, a few times a week, that falls under the gamut of social drinking. So when they see this, and they find that when the elderly are, indulging in social drinking they relate this to be very innocuous or uninjurious and hence they would also like to emulate that and as i said a little earlier that alcohol is served now in most of the situations or get-togethers parties or even for small get-togethers at homes of people it's no longer a taboo for a young person to drink alcohol unlike you know several decades ago uh, which was in our country in india certainly in the western countries drinking alcohol in the in the age group that you mentioned is uh, no longer a taboo although 18 plus is mostly accepted anything less than 18 uh, is still considered to be uh, uh, somewhat not societally accept acceptable at the end of the day so as far as my thoughts go, I don't think so. There should be a negative pressure on children. If there's more negativity at the end of the day of criticism or cynicism, they will be more likely to go ahead and try something, um, which otherwise they would have tried in moderation. And uh, in the process, you know, that can lead to unnecessary bad practices you know, and uh, causing uh, healthcare problems. Sir, we have all heard that uh, a little bit of alcohol is good for your heart. So, 
in contrary to that what would you say is the quantity of alcohol that is harmful on for an individual on a regular basis well alcohol as as a substance has been used since time immemorial or since the dawn of civilization because alcohol we all know is a product of fermentation of various things from grapes down to a variety of grains at the end of the day so this was available even in the prehistoric times amongst the civilization where they knew or learned how to make alcohol the reason why alcohol became into use even in those times is because it is a very uh, relaxing uh, form of uh, substance when human beings consume alcohol leads to <coughs> relaxation of the mind it relaxes the so called limbic system of your brain and gives you a sense of buoyancy a sense of happiness and uh, and when it is drank in the right portion raw in moderation it certainly kind of induces a feeling of uh, happiness and de-stressing and uh, de-stressing an individual so given this all of these effects of alcohol if it is done consumed in the right proportion then people will not have future health problems now what is the current quantity of alcohol at the end of the day you know we always talk about gender bias in every aspect of society but certainly consumption of alcohol has a distinct gender bias gender bias from the scientific aspect but the difference of quantity of consumption is different from when compared to men and women now it is said that if it is somebody is consuming if a man is consuming more than 280 grams of alcohol per week and a woman is consuming more than 120 to 140 grams of alcohol per week now what does that mean a can of beer which is 12 ounces has 14 grams of alcohol a glass of wine which is about 5 ounces has 14 grams of alcohol hard liquor say whiskey or brandy if you consume in 1.5 ounces it has 14 grams of alcohol now the proportion of alcohol in each of these are different beer has roughly about 5% volume wise whereas wine about 12% whereas hard liquors are anywhere from 40 to 80% so how do we calculate we calculate by the grams of alcohol in a given drink so when i speak about a can of beer or a glass of wine or a drink of scotch at the end of the day having 14 grams of alcohol you can simply do the math which comes to roughly about say two drinks a day if somebody is drink two one and a half ounces of whiskey a day or two glasses of wine a day then he or she is consuming about 28 to 30 grams of alcohol and you multiply by seven days that comes to 210 grams of alcohol so i gave you the number earlier if men are consuming more than 280 grams of alcohol they are susceptible to after a certain length of time 5 to 8 years of developing liver disease including cirrhosis of the liver and for women we talked about 120 to 140 which is essentially a drink to drink and a half at the most you know at the most per day so what should i advocate or what is advocated as the safest drink as the safest range of drinking probably a drink or so or a drink or two a few times a week is perhaps safe now the other very important aspect of alcohol is binge drinking many times people say i don't drink on weekdays you know there are work and the things like that but suddenly if you are binge drinking on the weekends you know youngsters consume there is enough stories or enough articles published where they consume you know somewhere around even 30 drinks on the weekend such binge drinking is significantly injurious than drinking in small portions or recommended quantities during uh, spread around for the entire week so you calculate 30 drinks you're consuming at the end of the week and you multiply that with what i just gave you about 14 grams of alcohol you're way over 
the recommended threshold. So also be mindful of this binge drinking and, uh, and let your normal uh, so-called acceptable drinking which are causing health should be in those grams which have just illustrated. So that was a very accurate and precise description. Um, yeah. Sir, uh, like you were just mentioning, uh, please tell our audience what they can expect from the liver of such an individual on the long, longer run. That's a very good question. Now let us talk about what alcohol does to your liver or to other organs of the body. So we all know that anything that is done excessively in life is detriment to one's health. You know, if you're smoking, you're risking yourself to develop lung cancer, brain strokes, heart disease, vascular disease, all of those things, cancers, whatnot. So does alcohol too. If it is abused, what happens is alcohol causes injury to the liver. And such an injury to the liver can manifest in various forms. Initially, alcohol causes what we call as a fatty liver, which means to say there's an excess accumulation of fat in the liver. Within this phase, you know, of drinking or development of the fatty liver, most of the times our patients are asymptomatic, which means they don't have any symptoms. They're not aware unless and until for some reason the doctor uh, that he or she is visiting recommends to do an ultrasound and then they find this fatty liver or do a blood test, they may see the liver enzymes to go up. So fatty liver manifests in 40 to 80% of the people who drink alcohol, without exception. Even sometimes normal drinking of alcohol. The next stage of injury, we call this as alcohol-induced fibrosis, or which is scarring of the liver. And this involves roughly about anywhere from 10 to 30% of the patients during the lifetime. And this stage of fibrosis then, it progresses to the end stage of the liver, what we call as cirrhosis of the liver. All of us are familiar with the word cirrhosis. Cirrhosis essentially means, which comes from the Greek language, scirrhus means hard. So here the liver, which is a sponge type organ, the normal liver is very soft and spongy. So when this becomes very hard, scirrhous, hard, what I had mentioned, we call this cirrhosis, where the liver becomes, you know, lumpy, bumpy. And uh, that is the final pathologic uh, or the final disease entity that alcohol induces with its abuse. Now, cirrhosis also leads to liver cancer. So those who have cirrhosis in their lifetime, about 10% of them, uh, 10 to 15 percent of them can anticipate to develop, you know, cancer of the liver. So this is, this is the spectrum of what we call as alcohol-induced, you know, liver injury in patients. There's a very fantastic uh, study uh, or publication in the West in 2020. In the year 2020, at one of the national conferences, it was presented by the American Liver Foundation that there has been an enormous increase in the consumption of alcohol leading to cirrhosis and deaths in the 24 to 35 year age group of individuals. This increase has been in the range of about 10 to 11 percent. For the first time this was observed, such highest increase was seen amongst the younger population leading to deaths from alcoholic cirrhosis of the liver. So aptly put, for today's subject that we're discussing, you know, the role of alcohol in the young and its effects. So we have to be cognizant of this particular happening, you know, in the, in, in, in the world. And uh, with, compared to in, in India, probably that incidence would be not that high um, when compared to the Western countries because the per capita consumption in the Western countries is certainly high. Now, what does that mean? America consumes, an American consumes somewhere between eight to nine liters of alcohol, you know, per capita consumption. You know, whereas in India, it is estimated to be 2.5 to 4.5 liters. 
products of alcohol. The highest consumption in the world is Russia, which is about 12 to 13 percent. 12 to 13 uh, liters, I'm sorry. 12 to 13 liters, the you know, highest consumption in the world is in Russia. The African con countries consume much lesser. So the spectrum is all over the place from anywhere from 0.5 liters to 13 liters of per capita consumption. Hence, in the Western disease, we are seeing this. And it will not be too far away with our current behavioral patterns of the youth and their increased consumption of alcohol. Sooner than later, perhaps we'll see the same statistic in our country with regards to alcohol-related cirrhosis and alcohol-related deaths. Now, apart from the liver, there are other organs that alcohol, alcohol can affect. The heart, the pancreas, the brain. So in the heart, long-term drinking or excessive drinking has shown Calling, it weakens the heart muscle, and these patients develop a condition called alcoholic cardiomyopathy. Pancreas, it can damage the pancreas, it can cause pancreatitis, which is called inflammation of the pancreas, and repeated attacks of pancreatitis can lead to pancreatic insufficiency. That is, pancreas is an important organ at the end of the day because pancreas makes insulin, which is extremely important. In metabolism for blood sugars, pancreas makes various digestive enzymes which are important in the digestion of our carbohydrates, protein, and fat. So when people drink excessively, this silent injury to the pancreas is not known to them, and they manifest in complications of recurrent episodes of pancreatitis, and some of them will go on to develop even pancreatic cancer. To the brain, we already know, most of us, that alcohol Excessive alcohol can lead to impairment of memory. Um, it can cause certain conditions called nutrition, through the virtue of nutrition deficiencies, along with drinking, called vernicus and cephalopathy. It can cause cerebellar diseases where your ability to walk straight, those things can be impaired. And alcoholic dementia, that alcohol, you know, provoking or inciting. You know, dementia, which is essentially, you know, loss of memory and uh, loss of your cognitive abilities and all of those things can also manifest. So it's a multifaceted attack on the human body and the various organs that excess drinking can eventually lead to and compromise, you know, good, happy standard of living. Uh, sir, uh, I'm sure our younger audience would want to know the difference between the effect on liver of a young individual like them and an adult. Because uh, alcohol, as today's topic we are discussing, is about how younger generation is being affected. So, is there a difference? If there is, what it is? It's a very good question that you asked. You know, the young have younger livers, and the older people have older livers. And uh, does age make a difference at the end of the day? I already gave you all uh, the impact on gender difference, that women are more susceptible to for the same quantities of alcohol that men drink at the end of the day. There is no difference in terms of effect of alcohol on a young liver or an older liver. Now, the difference being, yes, comorbidities. Certainly, older people will have other problems, other health care problems. You know, obesity, for example, if somebody is very obese, you know, somebody is smoking, you know, somebody is on certain types of medications, or somebody has already been exposed to hepatitis viruses, whether it is hepatitis B or hepatitis C, you know, these are the people who are at increased risk of injury. In today's world, where obes obesity has become like an, like an epidemic. Truly, it has become an epidemic across the world. And India, the rest of the world does not understand. We're only poor as a developing country. There is enough poverty, and 500 million people or 600 million people live under poverty and all of those things. But they don't understand that we're the fifth or sixth rich nation in the world in terms of our increasing obesity today. So then, you have this problem of overweight and obesity and the smoking, then you're far more susceptible to an injury of your liver. So certainly, 
elderly people to their comorbidities and other conditions may be a little more susceptible than a young. But if you take the actual impact, the biochemical effect of alcohol on a liver cell, whether it's a 16 year old or a 40 year old or a 60 year old, you know, there is no, there is no difference. Now, one more thing I'd like to emphasize, it has been published enough in healthcare literature. Two people can drink the same, of alcohol, same amount of alcohol. One can develop problems with the liver or cirrhosis at the end of the day over a period of time, and the other may not. Just like many other things in life, our human bodies are dictated by the infrastructure of our genetic play, the kind of DNA we inherit from our parents or what you're endowed with. So there are genetic polymorphisms, means gene variations that can make significant difference in one individual being susceptible to smaller amounts of drinking of alcohol than another individual not being susceptible in drinking higher amounts of alcohol. And we see this every day in our practices. There are people who drink, who don't have any liver disease, and they're doing fine. They live a nice, you know, full life of 80, 90, 100 years. But there are others who, by the age of 25, 30, 35, they already develop liver cirrhosis. So not only your comorbid conditions, but the genetic makeup, the genetic polymorphisms, you know, also play a role in terms of you know, the long-term impact on your liver from drinking alcohol. Right. Sir, would you say that there will be an effect on growth and development of a young individual attributing to their alcoholism? Yes, in terms of not a direct impact that alcohol will cause growth retardation, but nutritional deficiencies that are associated with alcohol. What happens if an individual is, is getting his calories from just drinking and not eating properly. And even if he's eating, not eating a balanced diet. And the, this diet is deficient of serious and significant nutrients. And these are the people who suffer from, you know, alcohol-induced nutrition deficiencies, which in turn can cause various problems or diseases, for example. You know, thiamine deficiency. Thiamine is a very important vitamin. When somebody is deficient in thiamine, then these people can develop nerve problems, you know, tingling sensation, numbness, and sometimes the brain's memory can be affected and things like that. So sometimes patients have diarrhea, you know, of, uh, from, uh, from them drinking by the loss of, from diarrhea, you can lose many nutrients and in the process, you'll not be gaining weight. So, yes, alcohol will have an effect if you're excessively consuming with regards to your proper, uh, regards to your growth from the standpoint of nutrition deficiencies. Uh, sir, uh, during discussing the effects of alcohol on health, we were talking about uh, multiple factors and its consequences. So, would you say that there is a correlation between diabetes and uh, excessive alcohol intake? Yes, there is definitely a correlation. A little while ago, I mentioned that alcohol causes pancreatitis or it has an effect on the pancreas. Now, the pancreas is a large organ that is situated below the stomach. It extends across the abdomen, you know, it has a head, body, and tail. It has a very important function in terms of uh, human physiology. It makes very important enzymes, very important hormones. Now, repeated insults to the pancreas, it causes pancreatic atrophy, means the cells die in the pancreas, and this ability to produce adequate hormones and enzymes also gets impaired. So, alcohol, uh, pancreas, when it makes insulin, that is responsible for your sugar metabolism at the end of the day, making your sugars in control. If that function is lost because of injury to the pancreas, certainly you become a diabetic. You know, and patients who have who develop diabetes, adults, you know, what we call as adult onset diabetes, the 
take a history in these patients if they have been drinking, if so for how long, if they have been drinking excessively, and uh, certainly this can it can give rise to you know this problem of developing diabetes. Now further, if alcohol is not the cause of diabetes, if you have developed diabetes because of your obesity, because of your uh, dietary habits, and because of lack of exercise, because of genetic inheritance, and then you drink alcohol, you know, it also has an impact on proper management or of diabetes in those patients. Right, sir. So going back to what we discussed, cirrhosis of liver seems to be the most common consequence. Can you please explain to our audience what exactly happens to a healthy liver due to excessive and prolonged alcohol intake? Good. First, let us uh, just focus for a few seconds with regards to, you know, what does the liver do? You know, liver is the largest organ in the human body that God has designed uh, the, the, the human body. Other than the skin, you know, of course, thing is, skin is an external part. As for the internal organs go, the liver is the largest organ. And for, firstfully, the creator has uh, created this large organ with a dual blood supply. So what, is it, so what does that mean? Liver has a role in making lots of enzymes, hormones, proteins. All of these things are extremely important in preserving you know, good health of an individual. You know. So it does also has what we call as an excretory function, just like the kidneys. The kidneys eliminate you know, certain toxins in the body on a daily basis, so does the liver. You know, when we take medications, when we're eating things, and uh, and uh, when we are, uh, uh, you know, drinking alcohol, all of these things, you know, the liver has an important role to, to metabolize these things and eliminate what is considered to be not necessary for the body in the form of toxins, etc. So when this function is compromised, you know, when, when this function is compromised, then liver disease is initiated. As I mentioned earlier, the first insult to the liver is accumulation of fat in the liver. This chronic accumulation of fat impairs the function of the liver, and gradually it leads to liver cell death, which causes scarring in the liver. And that scarring is called fibrosis something that is caught. I mentioned earlier the liver is a sponge-type organ. This sponge-type organ starts becoming harder. And when the liver cell death happens, you can just imagine the function of the liver becomes compromised. If 20% of the liver is, is, is has fibrosed or not functioning, or 30% not functioning, or 70% not functioning, then what happens is you develop progressive liver disease over a period of time and ultimately it ends up in cirrhosis of the liver. Now one important aspect, you know, we have to kind of understand this very well, not take advantage of, of uh, the function of the liver from what I'm saying. The liver has an enormous capacity to regenerate. What does that mean? The liver has an enormous capacity to suffer many insults on a repeated basis and still function normally in an individual. That's one of the reasons why alcoholic liver disease or alcohol-induced liver disease is a stealthy disease. It's a stealth. People that would not have any symptoms or signs for a long time to come until they almost develop cirrhosis. Majority of the people will not become familiar that alcohol has caused fatty liver or alcohol has caused scarring of the liver. So the stealthiness of this disease, unfortunately, masks the effects of alcohol for, for a long period of time in individuals who are, who are abusing alcohol. So the end pathway is where the liver becomes very hard. When the liver becomes very hard, it is not functioning and not able to do its metabolic functions or excretory functions. What is immune functions? Liver is also very important in in preserving or helping in the body's immunity. The various 
immune cells or immunological diseases. You know, if you're not having healthy liver, oh, that can also be that can also be compromised. So young individuals, youth, as I mentioned earlier, statistics in the West, they are equally susceptible to this problem. And today's world, as the consumption of alcohol is increasing, we are finding younger individuals developing cirrhosis and even coming for liver transplantation. We have transplanted a 28-year-old you know, individual from Delhi you know, about two years ago who was drinking alcohol and less than from age 14. So it will not spare anyone unless and until you're lucky enough to get a genetic polymorphism by the virtue of inheritance. But alcohol will not spare the poor, not the rich. You know, it's an equal justifier again today in causing this problem. So that was a very beautiful explanation. Thank we you. have uh, discussed multiple consequences of excessive alcohol consumption and the con conditions it induces. But uh, what about the treatment options that are available for treating these conditions, sir? Okay. Now, first, let us let us attack the treatment of those who abuse alcohol. Can we help those people to become addicts? You know, who is an addict? Obviously, a person who cannot refrain from doing certain things or breaking a certain habit that is injurious to your health. You know, if an addict to smoke, if an addict to drugs, and if an addict to alcohol, then alcohol is a drug at the end of the day. So can we do something before they develop liver disease or consequences of alcohol induced various other organ damage. Yes, that should be the first goal. So what are the methods or what are the things that are available in the society to help these patients? One of the things we call as alcohol rehabilitation. Can we rehabilitate someone with this problem or break this habit? The answer is yes. Now such rehabilitation happens in in a very structured environment where there are centers that are exclusively dedicated for patients with alcohol rehabilitation. Also, uh, unfortunately, in our country, we have to go a very long way in establishing such structured centers, unlike in the West. Now, such rehabilitation can happen on an inpatient basis or on an outpatient basis. Number two, there are a variety of drugs in today's world or medications that are available to help a patient to break the habit. You know, we have traditional drugs, we have modern drugs, and we have more drugs which are in the research pipeline. So one is pharmacotherapy, which means to say by the help of medications, can we assist this patient to, to break the habit of uh, excess consumption and help him with this addiction problem. So prevention is better than cure at the end of the day. That should be the motto. And that's what we practice at Continental at all times. And that has been my life motto. Can I help an individual before the person really succumbs to a problem by the virtue of developing a disease? And here, prevention is basically how to break this habit. Now, the other question that you raise is that, you know, what are the treatments for once the person develops a disease. Yeah. Now, I mentioned with regard to the liver, first thing is a fatty liver. Now, there are certain things to do when the patient develops a fatty liver, but the only answer in these things is stopping alcohol. If you continue to indulge in that and do certain medical therapies, which are evolving, you know, which not yet become standard of care, then unfortunately, what happens is it defeats the purpose. You're still engaged in the same toxin that you're consuming or poison that you're consuming. The other hand, you're trying to take the medication that won't help. Now, let's talk about a patient with cirrhosis. What's his prognosis? Okay, what can we do about it? You know, when a patient with cirrhosis, he develops various complications. You know, he develops complications of excess fluid accumulation in the body. He develops complications of nutrition deficiencies. You know, and he develops issues sometimes. Uh, with his uh, pancreas, starts losing his muscle mass, and all of these things happen. Yes, we can intervene, address each one of these on the basis of symptoms, but we will not be able to reverse 
we will not be able to reverse the damage that is already done to the liver. Everyone has to understand this. There is no medication yet in the universe to reverse cirrhosis and help that patient. The only, al only option the patient has in end-stage cirrhosis in today's world is getting a new liver or a liver transplantation. You know, somebody donating a liver or transplanting a liver from a dead person called cadaveric transplantation. Other than this, is completely limited by lack of any drug in these patients. So it's very important if a person of the developing cirrhosis, say for example, if he quits alcohol for the next five years, the probability of that person surviving increases with each year after quitting alcohol. So the significant rate limiting step here again is stop the offending agent, buy time, you know, eat well, and if you develop complications, see your liver specialist and get that to manage or treat it. So also for the heart, if the heart is involved, then you're trying to put them on medications to help the heart function better. So also with pancreas, if you develop diabetes, then certainly you're taking medications to control your blood sugars, including insulin, as it becomes necessary. Sir, uh, considering the prevalent pandemic COVID-19 that is going on right now, would you say all the treatment procedures that we have discussed right, uh, as just now are safe to undergo? Yes. So the pandemic has nothing to do with regards to management of patients with alcohol use and its diseases and its uh, complications. There is no contraindication or there is no uh, non-recommendation that these patients should not be vaccinated. You know, And uh, so all of the things that you do normally to a patient at the end of the day you know, will be done in a patient who has alcohol use liver problems and uh, there's no difference you know to basically summarize uh, sir we have discussed uh, briefly about the statistics of us and uh, in drinking patterns so would you say there is a significant impact of the western culture in indian drinking habits well i think as the world has becoming or has become a one giant platform in today's access to communication, you know, social media, you know, your Netflix, your Amazon, your TV uh, exposure of the Western culture so directly at the end of the day, certainly it is having a significant impact on our population in this country and particularly the youth. But as I said earlier, young minds try to emulate most of the time, what others are doing and what they're learning from other societies, their impacts and whatnot, sometimes good, sometimes bad and whatnot. So certainly it is having the impact of the Western civilization. Western civilization always impacted us from various aspects throughout our history at the end of the day. You know, not only from the standpoint of human health and disease, but from the standpoint of our own industrialization, economic, you know, growth and uh, social uh, uh, upscaling and so many of these things you know we have certainly learned certain things from the western culture and the west is west you know is having an impact on our consumption of alcohol you know at the end of the day it will not be too far away that we can really be reaching uh, you know the same per capita consumption of alcohol in India, we are just about uh, halfway behind the United States, and we will, we will very likely, I guess, I, I have this premonition that uh, we'll be no less than what America is consuming today on a per capita basis. I'm sure our younger audience is uh, able to relate to. So, being yeah. a highly experienced gastroenterologist like yourself, 
and attributing to more than 40 years of your experience please tell us the recent advances in the treatment of liver disease that you have come across yeah significant advances have been made in management of various liver diseases across the world and such advances also have been made in our country where our patients are able to access these various medical therapies or surgical therapies at the end of the day now when we talk about the liver we distinguish between basically two or three categories that is the person who is infected with hepatitis viruses you know which is hepatitis b and c particularly whereas hepatitis a is an acute infection and once you have hepatitis a you recover from that whereas hepatitis b and c has the potential and the trend to become chronic so various advances have been made in terms of drug therapy of these patients and we are able to treat them and induce remission and prevent developing cirrhosis or its complications and liver cancer so there's one aspect one group of diseases that we call as viral induced you know inflammatory conditions of the liver second is alcohol that we discussed third is a group of liver diseases called autoimmune liver diseases where your own body's immunity recognizes the liver as a foreign organ and starts attacking and damaging the liver now significant advances have been made even in this field in terms of good medication some of the newer medications which are able to help these patients and again prevent you know complications the greatest advancement in the management of liver disease has been made you know, when such an option was not available before 1980s is liver transplantation you know you such option when patients before that used to develop cirrhosis of the liver there's no other option but to unfortunately die of its complications but in today's world if everything becomes acceptable the patient can be offered a new liver and that liver helps to uh, save the patient now the conditions where transplantation happens can be from hepatitis viruses leading to chronic liver disease or from alcohol or from autoimmune conditions all of the things which are just said so in any of these conditions the person can have or receive liver transplantation provided he qualifies for certain criteria um, in terms of his evaluation or her evaluation so that was a very beautiful explanation sir uh, lastly on the occasion of world liver day what is that message you would like to give to today's younger generation well i think uh, i'm not a spoiler at the end of the day enjoy your alcohol okay that's my message but do it in moderation be careful respect the red stop signs you know life is all about you know how we come to respect and conduct ourselves within the realms of what is good and what is what is bad so when i said the red stop sign if you're driving a car certainly at the red stop sign you're going to stop and most of the red stop signs are in the west in our country we use red flashing light or red still it's a red stop sign at the end of the day so we respect and stop the car because if you don't you're going to crash it's very simple so with alcohol also respect the red stop signs do it moderation do it for social reason do it for relaxation purposes you know do it for building a uh, uh, good uh, you know friendship or Uh, whatever that uh, ultimately gives you the satisfaction over indulgence in anything over indulgence in food over indulgence in uh, uh, in, in uh, excess of it, anything at the end of the day you know is a problem so alcohol is no exception to that you know, that's my message to the youth that in today's world there's a lot of money that is circulating it is available easily there are many liquor shops in our state of telangana many bars that have opened up you know here per capita that they have increased so the choices the youth face today are extraordinarily tempting when such a temptation and peer pressure exists you know you're bound to emulate or accept a social habit which is not necessarily evil okay which is not necessarily evil but 
it has to be calibrated and it has to be controlled and we have to follow certain accepted uh, rules of the game uh, in terms of your health and to be safe. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your valuable time. We know you have an extremely busy schedule. So we are very grateful for uh, giving our audience a better understanding about alcoholism and its effects. Dear audience, you can drop your questions in the comments so they can be answered in the future. To book an appointment with Dr. Guru N. Reddy, please follow the link given in the description or contact us through the information provided in the description. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Appreciate it. All the best. Thank you.